Hello, hello, everyone. It is Kenyon here. I am here on Basketball Rewind, and I am also joined by Coach Roach and Beyond the Locker Room. I will leave their information down in the description down below. Before we get into our draft coverage today, which we will be covering Keontae George first and foremost, I wanted to talk about some of the comments that Nick Nurse said, or at least the comments that came out. I will let one of the other two start before I go on my rant because uh, I, I definitely have some thoughts. Sure, um, I'll, I'll grab the mic first then. Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's, always, it's always a pleasure here to be here with Hopeful and, and, and Coach Roach. Can't wait to dig into some of these draft um, prospects, but we got to deal with a little housekeeping, as they say, at the top. And um, Nick Nurse made our life a little busier in this case when it came to content <laughs> with what he had to say yesterday before the game. I must admit, I, you know, someone mentioned it yesterday, we're discussing it um, on spaces, and I'm not sure it was you hopeful or not, but can you recall ever a coach actually doing this or saying something like this before that? I think someone mentioned something in one of the European soccer leagues that maybe someone had done something similar to this, but you really got to dig deep to find something where a coach pretty much said, using the, a lot of past tense when he is speaking about <laughs> the, the given situation. With five uh, games left to go. So when you are still in the midst of potentially getting even up to this in the six or seven seed, like it just seems an odd time coming off a three game winning streak to kind of say, Hey, this is the time long. I'm going to say this. I mean, to put it in perspective, a year ago, he was getting rumored around the Lakers, maybe do the clutches alliances, wherever the case may be. He dodged that with some humor and moved on from that pretty quickly in this case here. Compared to what we got just now after some of the rumors that come out from the Doug Smith article and some other articles about, you know, rumors of him going to Houston in the offseason, it was very interesting that he did not, he was willing not to dodge this one with any sort of like self self deprecating humor or anything like that. He was like, no. oh no, we can talk about it. Um, so I found that fascinating and it kind of tells you the state of play pretty much in the Raptors organization at the moment, you know, that he is willing to say, yeah, but I'm willing to, I want to put this out here today. So I'm like, okay. So I think um, there's a lot going on as a lot of people have said. And I think that this is pretty much in my mind, the end of the Nick nurse era in Toronto. Um, I have my own opinions of what I think of Nick Nurse as a coach, but you know, I'll leave that to you all in this case, how you feel. He's done some good stuff with the team. Obviously, he brought us the championship as the coach, but I think it might be time maybe for him to move on to other pastures at this point. And I think for the betterment of the team and the roster, I think it might be you know best for, for everyone to part ways at the end of the season. But we'll see. Stranger things have happened, as they say. And coach, before yep. you say uh, anything, I'm just going to say really quickly, I'm going to try to find the quotes and put them on the screen. Uh, so while we talk, um, I will definitely put that on the screen for the viewers at home. So yeah, continue. So I'm thinking this was in reference to a Doug Smith article that was written about nurses future with the team and reflecting about the season and stuff like that. That's what, and then one of the reporters had asked him about it. And that's when nurse probably went more in depth than he should have like when you're five or six games left in the season you know a team is going to look at that and say you know what odd timing this is um you know if i was one of those players i, I would probably feel that way now i don't think it affected how they played the other night against philadelphia it's like philadelphia you beat them personally they get anything to do with it, but we're going to find out in the next few games if this does have anything to do with it because it doesn't get much worse than Charlotte. So uh, mm -hmm. this is going to be two must-win games. Whether um, Nurse is at the helm, whoever's at the helm, what they think of Nurse, it doesn't matter. You just got to go out and get the job done. But the timing of this is very strange. That that's for sure. And some of what Nurse had said about you know I've been in the game for ten years. I need to reflect on that. From a private standpoint, if that's how he feels, 100% agree with him. But when he makes this stuff public, it comes across as, well, right. maybe they're looking to get rid of me, or maybe I'm looking to find greener pastures somewhere else. Maybe I don't feel appreciated enough. That's kind of how it comes across to a bit of the fan base. One of those three things that I said, or maybe there's a combination of both. So it's going to be interesting to see over the next few weeks, assuming that this team pot gets into the, they'll get into the play in tournament. But after that, it's hard to say they're going to make that eight seed. Although I think they're good enough to get the seventh or eighth seed. 
um, we're going to see moving forward, I guess, what's up with his future. Because he technically still has a year left on his contract. He can come back and, and do that. Um, but also, he's probably looking for an extension at the same time. And he knows he's had a rough year. He's got one year left. It, it might not look too good moving forward for an extension. So we're going to see. Stay tuned. Exactly. I think uh, I've heard the extension idea floated where maybe he is angling for an extension, but uh, this is probably not the best way to do that, in my opinion. Um, Usually not a good job to, uh, you know, turn on the gas and leave a match lying around (laughs) on the way out when you're selling your house. But uh, just my opinion. Um, So on to greener and warmer pastures namely the future (laughs) of the franchise and with the draft coming up and with us getting close to the end of the season, because personally, as much as I uh, am going to enjoy seeing playoff basketball, I don't see them playing until July, but I would love to see it if they can do it. So with that being said, uh, we are at, as of the filming of today, we are coming to the close of the NCAA tournament, March Madness. As uh, we know, we just finished, uh, you know, it is no longer March, so that is not an April Fool's jokes. And, uh, you know, with that being said, we've been kind of talking about guards, 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 the fact that we need rim pressure and another more dynamic creator on this team. And so what better way but to introduce none other than Keontae George. And I'm going to start with you, Beyond, uh, for just the bio, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, um, Keontae George, um, shooting guard from Baylor University. Um, he's a 6'4 guard, 185 pounds, um, f- freshman in this case. He's has the potential to be a three level scorer. He, you know, he, you know, he he's a he's a bit streaky. Could be a bit streaky at the three. Could get to the lane a little bit. Um, you know, he has a little bit of a mid range game too. Defensively, it. it you know it's decent, but it needs work. I put it that way in this case here from that standpoint. But is but he in my mind he's a guy that I think has a very high upside if if things go right in this case with him in the right system. Um, I'm looking forward to speaking about him today. Uh, you know, like he's yeah he's a fascinating draft prospect, and I, I'm curious to get your thoughts on what you guys think of him and where he fits and how he could fit perhaps in the Raptors. So yeah, we're looking forward to getting into this. So uh, I guess my thoughts, sorry, I, I'm still learning to unmute and mute my mic. Uh, <laughs> uh, my thoughts are he provides something that we've lacked. I do have my concerns, which we will get into a little bit later, but I do like overall what I see. Um, I'll give my own comparison of what I saw before we get into all the nitty gritty details. But at first I thought he was an uh, less athletic Jalen Green, and then I rewatched Jalen Green, and I was like, oh my goodness, that even that isn't doing Jalen Green justice. So I uh, have changed it, and I think he's much closer to, uh, I want to say a cross between Zach Levine, uh, but with more defensive upside and shorter, um, or maybe a uh, Bradley Beal, or even you can see some shades of uh, a certain uh, Canadian Jamal Murray. So, I mean, as a 6'4 combo guard, uh, first and foremost, I think he's a walking bucket. And I think that that has, you know, kind of been attached to him and uh, a label that has been attached to him throughout this entire thing. So, uh, with that being said, I think we should just get into his offense. Coach, what do you think about his offense? Well, he certainly can create his own shot off the dribble. I've noticed sometimes when I've been watching some of his film, when he looks like he's out of control, he's actually in control. Um, he's got a pretty strong uh, game in terms of creating space for himself, being able to um, use his dribble wisely. I mean, that like he's able just to create enough space, whether he's going to the side or a step back. I love the form that he has. Um, I, I've seen some video where he just comes off screens, catch and shoot. He's got no issue with that. Um, like Kind of like you guys said, we don't have many guys like him on our team right now. Um, you know, he shot about 34% from three. I actually think there's room where he can get up to 38% from three. I really do think that is there in his game. Um, I, I do feel like, like Kenyon, you just said, 
he that's a good comparison that you said between Beal and Jamal Murray. I never really thought of the Jamal Murray aspect, but more that I watch him, I actually see quite a bit of Jamal Murray in him right now. I think it's a really good comparison. The the offensive is okay from what I can see, like the offensive win shares. They're not great, but they're okay. But sometimes numbers can be deceiving as well because it depends on who you're playing with and what system you're playing in as well. Um, you know, Baylor's a good program. This is a top-notch university program that won, you know, the NCAA tournament just a few years ago. And they have a track record of developing pretty good talent sort of there as well. So I suspect Keontae George is going to go in the top 10. Could he fall to us? Maybe, but I suspect he's going to go before we have a chance to select. Right. So I think to provide a little bit more context over why, um, because lately he has fallen relative to others in the mock drafts, um, he apparently went through an injury midway through the season and has not really been the same since then. And so... Um, maybe that has also affected his, uh, you know, efficiency and percentage in some of these situations, but the form and the tape looks really good. And um, similar to another prospect that we'll get into on another uh, episode of these, um, as you would say, sometimes you have to look beyond the numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that there's more to George uh, in this case, and I'll just kind of quickly uh, speak uh, before throwing it over to Beyond and say, not only is that, uh, every, do I agree with everything that you said, um, I think that there were times when you dig into the advanced numbers and say you compare it to a guy like Gary Trent, who has, you know, a, a defined skill set that we need on this team. And I say, well, this guy could provide what Gary does and maybe a bit more. Yes, Gary was a better shooter in college than Keontae. At the same time, Gary if you look at the advanced numbers and you compare the assist percentage, I think Gary, and I just have it up right here, Gary was had an assist percentage that was 6.8% uh, versus 22, or sorry, 21, sorry, 20.1%. Um, so a big difference. And I mean, we see that on the court, um, you know, for all of the uh, ability and shot making that Gary provides, uh, that's something that he hasn't really uh, been able to unlock in his game. I think that's probably the best way of, uh, of putting it. And so having a guy who can is more than willing to do the shot making uh, before getting into the depths of, of what that means, I think the fact that he is a willing passer, um, that's a very good sign. Um, anything that you want to say about uh, your guy, I guess? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, let me start in reverse um, with your point with the willing passer. I mean, there is parts of his game when the judgment, when it comes to passing is a little questionable. I know that might be a bit of concern from, you know, obviously having a high turnover rate in this case here, but I think with the type of team that you anticipate to have next year, the ball wouldn't be in his hands as much for that to be a case. And you could bring him along slowly as a playmaker if you want to maybe play more with second units. Well, he'll be probably in the second unit anyhow if you were to get drafted. And you get to, you know, you can experiment a little bit more with him as the year goes on. But on the offensive side, and this goes to Coach's point, he's kind of like, he's kind of like in this case, he fills in all the holes in this case, all the gaps. You think about it, you know, you put in the plaster in this case here. He's the type of guy from an offensive diet standpoint, he fills in all the areas that we don't do well right now. So in this case, one of the things from an intangible standpoint, you know, you hear a lot of people talk about that he's a confident guy. You know, we don't have a lot of dogs on this team, per se. Like, you know, guys that don't. <laughs> and it would be nice to have a guy like he has no fear in this case here to take any shot at any time. Yes, sometimes you might have to rein that in a little bit. But I'd rather have to rein a guy in than try to have a guy that you're trying to get it out of, which is much tougher, I think, in this case here. Second thing in this also, too, is he's a guy that also draws contact, which means foul shots, foul shots, foul shots. Yes. And you get the line. And that's another thing that we don't have enough of on this team, especially from the perimeter. And so to have that, I think is great to have as well, too. You know, there's some things that he does well that is would be a classic Raptor thing. He plays well in peace. Great. <laughs> so that's Raptor. That's Raptor-esque. You know? So that's fantastic. But I think also to the ability in this case to kind of create separation, which is another struggle on our team. So when shot clock's winding down, you have maybe one more guy on the court that can get his own shot. 
which right now we are, you know, if you, you, know, you watch the Sixers game, we are desperate in desperate need of. <laughs> desperate need of. So yeah. for that alone, I think, <laughs> I think, and I think I mentioned you guys offline, of all the guys that are in kind of our circle in this case from a Raptors perspective, to me, I think he, and I can't remember who the other one I had off the top of my head. Um, yeah, and Hendricks, I think, are the two guys that me have the largest upside to be actual stars. Where it's like, oh, okay. You know, and I would say, actually, I'll put Wallace in that category as well, too, actually. So the three of them, to me, are a little separating from some of the other guys that could be in this right. in this thing, in, the, in, this, <laughs> in this, this, this pool. They have the ability that if you hit, then you hit right. Watch out. And I think he could be one of those guys, man. 6'4", good size, great athleticism, which is good. Because I think one of the things on this team is a bit of a misnomer a little bit on this team. People view the Raptors as an athletic team. I don't. You know, the Ra- the Raptors don't have athletes that you think of, like world-class athletes, you know, no. high twitchy dudes in this case here. You think so when you see guys like Boucher. But it's pretty much like pretty much as a, you know, it's pretty much one jump and that's it. You know, Boucher's not climbing over anyone to dunk over a guy for the most part most of the times. Like, I'm talking about that type of world-class athleticism. But yeah, it's not like Jalen yeah. Green where it's like. No. Or, you know. Jump out the gym. <laughs> right. I'm not saying Jalen really Green or Shady Shark type of thing. But even the next level down, like, I mean, if you want to pick whoever is the next level down, like, the, we don't have that type of athleticism on our team right now. And I think the more we get more athletes on this team, the better. So, you know, and even I, Barnes, I, Barnes is is athletic, but he's athletic in very sp- particular ways. Like exactly. he's very strong, and yes. uh, but he's not, you know, he's yeah, not like a, yeah, he's not, he, yeah. He, I think for the most part, he's not bad from a standpoint, for a twitch standpoint, for offensive rebounding, he's pretty good in that part. But he's not climbing over. He's not, you know, he's not climbing over dudes in this case here to dunk on a guy or making some type of pirouette move in the air to get around yeah. the guy, like to circumvent something. So I, I think it's like the way that I put it, um, and I'll I'll kind of go to my my notes a little bit here um but in terms of barnes like he because he did you know cram it down just you know anyone in the comments who's gonna freak out and say oh he's he, no he did cram it down over uh what i think it was bam and someone else in the other game he has moments like that but i think it's the um the core strength and the body control within the air that not right. a lot of dudes have and it takes yeah. a long time to work on that because it's, it's right. more strength muscles, exactly. um, which helps with your posture, with which helps. It's just an underrated part of it. And so what I said is that he has an ability to both, uh, wa- um, well, first of all, I said he, had, he drives with zero fear. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he drives with <laughs> zero fear. And I also said that he has an ability to rise up against opposing defenses, even when they're closing in on him. Um, mm-hmm. he, le- he, ne- he does still need to learn when he is, uh, I guess, forcing it versus making the right pass. That being said, he does make the correct reads and sometimes is able to show that he can make a little bit more difficult reads and is willing to make that difficult pass. Mm-hmm. There's a couple times when it's like, oh, okay, that's a dangerous pass, but I'd rather someone who is willing to, uh, to try that than be a little bit more conservative. We've talked about that with, uh, with Fred at, at times where it's like, okay, Fred is a good um, passer, um, but he's not the best playmaker. And the reason why is because he's sometimes overly conservative with his passing. Mm-hmm. Not that he, he, he's gotten better. He has gotten better, but at the same time there, you know, as we all say that there's levels, whereas Scotty, there's times, you know, the, the look away or whatever, and he, he's able to manipulate, um, you know, defenses with, you know, sometimes how dangerous his passing are. Now, obviously, as time goes on, that's going to kind of get reined in. But yeah, uh, an, a couple other things that I said is I said he has a very high level uh, skill and talent that's always displayed with his advanced footwork on the perimeter. That's something that I definitely noticed. And then I think the other thing is that he, I seem to notice that he likes to use, now this is the problem, is um, he likes to use pick and roll. And a lot of his offense comes with uh, kind of navigation within the pick and roll. And the reason why I say that that's a problem is, uh, you know, going back to the top of this discussion with, uh, you know, a certain coach, uh, we have only really used the pick and roll recently. So how much would we really, uh, you know, be able to do that? I would say this case, once you have Pirtle, you have to use the pick and roll. So there's no choice. (laughs) Yeah. But I think with this kid though, like, to me, he looks he looks like he does fairly well in the pick and roll. I mean, he's a good yes. athlete. Yes. When he is able to either, you know, take his guy to the rim off the pick and roll or pull up for a jumper, he's he can do both. Some guys can only do one. I think I do think he has that skill set to do 
both. To me, you know who he kind of reminds me of a bit? It's a former Raptor. He reminds me a little bit of him. He reminds me of Norm Powell, a little bit like Norm. He's a that co- kind of combo guard. Um, he's got to fill out a bit more. You know, Norm had a Norm had a big wingspan too. He wasn't the best defender out there by any stretch of the means, but he could make shots and create shots for himself too and get to the rim yeah. fairly well. It's, it's funny you mentioned because the areas of his concern are similar to what Norm has as well, too. Funny enough. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, whereas sometimes it's like, okay, the pass might not have gone there, maybe not the right read. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I think also he he's shown an ability to be uh, willing and able to uh, be impactful off ball, which is also important and will be uh, important to have an instant impact on a team like mm-hmm. like ours. Um, so, yeah, no, I actually I agree with you. I think he is uh, I think he's incredible in the pick and roll. Um, and that's also why he reminded me a lot of Jamal Murray. Uh, Jokic and Jamal a couple years ago operating in the pick and roll in the in the playoffs was a thing of beauty. Um, but again, uh, which, but you, you know, I mean, beyond brought up a good point. It's like, if you have Pirtle, then you, you have to, there's no excuse. Um, on a side note, I've noticed that um, Coloco is completely off topic, but Coloco's done a lot better job in of screening and being used in pick and rolls as, as yeah. of late. But yeah. Yeah. And um, I think that's yeah. going to be guaranteed that I'll be part of his game because I suspect they're going to be doing a lot of leg weights. There's going to be a lot of leg days in the, in the offseason for Coloco. <laughs> And I think that alone will help him set better screens next year where he's not getting wedged out from the, from the pick. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. Um, I, I also just to cap off his scoring before going to the playmaking side, and I'm going to throw it back to you guys really quickly is, um, you know, I noticed that he's a three level scorer. Uh, I think we've all kind of stayed that. So he has a floater uh, game. He has, uh, you know, Again, really good footwork with things. I'm just reading off my notes, actually, funny enough. So really good things like Euro steps and other kind of jukes and jabs. Um, and, you know, again, I think that all of it was he he gets to the rim, is willing to get to the rim. For that reason, he is a good self-creator and he can create for others. Finally, which was really interesting, is I've seemed to find that he was a willing rebounder. Uh, and that, I think, especially on the offensive end, that can be very important. Uh, you know, funny enough, we haven't had a good rebounding guard since, you know, a certain, you know, Lowry left. Uh, mm-hmm. Even though Lowry wasn't much taller than Fred, it's like Lowry was a triple-double DeRozan king. DeRozan was a pretty DeRozan good was a good rebounder as well, so. Yeah. Um, I, it's yeah. funny you mention that, because when I look at his tape, I, I, it keeps telling me he's 6'4", but when I look at him, he doesn't come across as 6'4", he seems to play bigger. Like, he seems to have a, like, I don't know if it's the frame he has or what, but it's like, it's funny. He had, like he and Nick Smith that we just did the other day, Junior. Essentially the same height, same weight. To be fair, so I'm gonna say, but he doesn't look like he doesn't look like he's like soaking wet, like he's 185. Like something yeah. about him, he could put on more mass a lot easier. I think Nick Smith will be able to. I don't know. Yeah. His frame looks different, and I mean, I question a little bit. They say 185. I'm like that don't look like a 185 dude when I look at him. Like he looks cut. Like, like, so, I mean, maybe that's what it was when he came in on the first day of campus, but what I'm seeing on the <laughs> tape, that dude looks like he's close to 200 now. That's what I'm looking at. And he looks like he put on weight pretty quickly. The other thing, too, is, to be fair, um, you know, because I don't want to go for all any folks or the Nick Smith Jr. fans, you know, let me just talk about some of the concerns you may have in this case here. And I think a lot of the concerns I see with him seem to be things that you could coach out of him, which in this case is a lot of judgment issues, decision-making, yes. shot selection, you know, I think even finishing around the rim, you know, you know, in this case, it sometimes is a bit of an issue with him, and that might be due to who's on the court with him on Baylor. It has to do with that, where it's like he is, the, you know, the focal point is him. Maybe when he's on a team where he's like the fifth option on the court sometimes, that might not be as much of an issue where he could gain more confidence around the rim. So there's things like that. I think that could, you know, even Norm, the funny, that's why he said, oh, he said Norm, because Norm at the beginning used to have trouble finishing around the rim. You know, yes. First, you know, yeah, yeah. He just, he had like, Jesus <laughs> It's like, yo, you're just bang, you're taking bank shots, like breaking the backboard, like, dude, you're like, where's the touch? So, <laughs> you know, so it's amazing to see how far Norman's come as a finisher now. He's like doing like little finger rolls like the Iceman and stuff like that, considering where he started from. So um, those things I'm not as concerned about, you know, I, I would rather have said before, have a little bit, you know, I'd rather have him pull back in this case a little bit from the reins a little bit than the other way around, man. You know, they always talk about the motor and that part, his motor seems pretty high in that sense. Yes, he's definitely not someone who floats. Yes. <laughs> important. Uh, coach, uh, thoughts, uh, final thoughts about his playmaking before we uh, 
<clears throat> kind of switch what over I've to his seen, defense. What I've seen on film, he's good in the pick and roll. Like not only is he good at um, kind of getting his own shot, but even creating for others too. Like even in the in transition, um, he's I've watched him make a few passes. Like I'm not saying they're Scotty esque, but they're close actually with some of the passes that he, that he is able to make. So I think the vision is pretty good, and I think what about I think he averaged about three assists per game this year, and I think it's he's per thirty six. Good for a college player in that position. And it, yeah, just to do a little bit of just to do a little bit of everything, but kind of like what what you said beyond uh, um, the things that I know is that he does struggle with. Those are teachable things like don't drive into four guys trying to get to the basket. It's not going to work in the NBA. Um, you know, maybe the shot selection, you don't have to take 20 shots a game right. like like some like some players in the NBA do. You don't have to do that. OK, um, so a lot of the things that he might struggle with, those those are things to be worked on and, and developed. So he's a good talent. Like he's definitely an NBA talent. He, he's some kind of hybrid of Beal. Beal's like best case, I would say, for him. A little bit of Jamal Murray. He's got some Norm Powell into him as well. I, I yeah, I think maybe Norm Powell. I think if if you hope Norm Powell is like his floor, if that's the worst, it is like okay, he's a good rotation player. It might be your sixth or seventh man off the bench. Is like exactly. Fair enough. That's great. I mean, you know, you put him aside, Scotty in the future, and Coloco is like, let's roll. So I, I don't see a problem with that. You know, at worst, he's like your fifth scorer on the team, so be it. But like, I think also, too, is like, if he, to your point, if he's a little higher, and now we're talking like, you know, the Beals, you know, elements to it, I don't think, you know, I think Beals' numbers coming out from a shooter standpoint was better. I think, you know, I think he's a little more streetier in that sense. Um, and I think one of the things I think, his, 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 the classic thing, I always say your greatest strength is your greatest, greatest weakness. His confidence in his ability is really also right. why, in this case, with some of the things we've discussed, the turnovers, you know, the poor judgment with passing at times, um, you know, the shot selection, those to me are all things to deal with confidence. It's like, yeah. yo, you to, yeah, you want to take every shot thinking over two dudes. Like, it's okay. It's like, it's okay. Right. Yeah. Right. right. That's, that's where it's like, okay. That's where it's like the coaching comes in. It's like, okay, pull back. If you're playing with better players, that will help too. So, um, yeah, I am fascinated by him because I think I told you guys offline, I think he might be from a pure scoring standpoint. I think besides maybe Whitmore, I think he might be right. like, you know, of like they say the top 15 guys, he might be the next best scorer of the group. In this case here, I think I could see him in the NBA, and this is like his ceiling. He could average four or five assists a game. I actually think his passing is pretty good. He already averaged four and a half rebounds, I think, in college, which is good for someone six foot four. You know, you get four and four from those two categories, he gets you, let's just say, 16 to 18 points. A pretty good basketball player. Well, you know who else he actually could remind you of, but we don't think of him that way in this case here. It could be a little bit. You know, because he didn't really have the same type of jump shot, but I think a little bit of DeRozan in him too. And Maybe so. Yeah, like you know, like it doesn't seem like it off the top, but like the way he could get the hoop and the rim in this case here, like that, like you know, he's not as tall as DeRozan. This that's a, a, I guess a disadvantage from that standpoint. And in any other ways, ahead of the curve with DeRozan when it comes to passing and playmaking that came along obviously afterwards with DeRozan. But there is elements of it where I can see on offense where it's like, okay, I can see where he shoots the ball is very much where areas where DeRozan obviously, you know, flourishes, and, you know. Right. And yeah. he, he's good, though. I know I'm just looking at his stats for this year. Seven threes a game. So that's one thing that uh, he'll have. He, he's probably one of those guys that's like an analytic stream. It's going to be layups or threes. Mm. But he's you not know, I don't... in between game, though. That's the thing with him. I yeah. Like. Yeah, he does have it, but yeah. I think we need to see. Hopefully, we see it a little bit more at the NBA level. Yeah, that well, it depends. Well, depend. We're going back to our first discussion. It depends a lot on what coach it is and who that coach is. <laughs> that is true, and that's now yeah. becoming a much more bigger discussion now on how that happens. Now, I think yeah. a week ago we kind of knew what type of coaching philosophy we're dealing with. We're not so sure as we did do this video now. <laughs> that is right. Now, one thing that's really interesting, I just looked up Norman Powell's college stats as well, just to compare, and it was very close in a lot of areas except for a couple. Again, the assist rate was down. One thing that, um, but the usage rate was actually much closer. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like a 10-point gap, but it was more like a five-point uh, five per point percentage gap. Um, now, one thing that's interesting 
about Keontae is, uh, and I think Beyond actually mentioned this earlier, is he gets to the line. But not only can he get to the line, he capitalizes at the line. He shoots almost 80% at the line, and I like that. Exactly. And uh, that's why I think that that 34 uh, percent from three and the 39 percent overall or, or i guess it's dipped down to 37 percent when you include the tournament and overall um from from the field you have to look beyond that with the numbers with this guy um, because i think if you if you focus on the free throws that indicates you know he might actually be able to shoot to me yeah. that's typically what you see is that you know if a guy and and he's getting to it at a decent sample size so it's not just you know he got to the line five times and, and, and made, you know, four of them and he's done, right? So, yeah. Right. Well, let's play a little game theory for a second. Like, if you think about, okay, what type of shot will you get in this <laughs> the league? Likely, it's this case here, from out of a Pascal double team, maybe a Scotty double team, and you kick out to him. And he has the ability, in this case, to put it on the bounce on the floor and pull up or get right the rack for a dunk. And he also has the ability just to shoot the three if you give him enough space. And why clean threes? And we've already gone through some of the statistics you know, that we've seen from just Siakam's numbers of how well he is passing out double teams to give guys catch and shoot threes. So if he just does that, and for what, and you know, I think there's a point that was mentioned in one of the reviews that we're talking about in this case is like, and some of the things people say is that, you know, he hits a lot of open threes, which is like God said to me in this case here for the Raptors. <laughs> like, like, let me tell you, if my cousin down the street can hit open three for the Raptors, I'll have him signed up tomorrow. Like, please, someone hit open three. I don't think there's a team in the league that gets as many open threes as the Raptors that miss them. It's ridiculous how many open threes the Raptors get. So, to me, if that, uh, I think I told when Coach mentioned and, and showed some of the, the stuff about that, and the attributes, that's the one I said, I, think I mentioned third from the bottom. That's the one that came to me. Unguarded threes. <laughs> he shoots almost like a, a crazy clip. It's like, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, you know, to see where he um, lands because he has been quite volatile where his, you know, he, you know, where his selection is. He and Hendricks, I think, have been the two guys where they've been all over the place. So we'll see uh, where, where yeah. he lands. I mean, it's, it's funny because people think um, we are – like I saw a post the other day is on Reddit, and it's like we're so down bad. And this is not a slight against this guy, but uh, is it Mark, Mark Quell or Marquise – um, Noel, the guy that was arguing with his coach and then just threw the pass. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And people yeah. were like, well, we should, we should draft him with our first round pick. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> no, he's a, I mean, very talented guy, more talented than any of us uh, on this call would be. Um, I think there might be other options with our first round Mark pick. Grass that we... a bottom, uh, as a bottom end second round pick. Yeah, it's like uh, so, it's like taking Zach Eady in yeah, in lottery. Yeah. You got your mid second <laughs> round pick in this case, yeah. Um, <laughs> I won't get there. I'll let you go rip on the Canadian boys. So I'll leave that be. Hey man, it shouts to Zach Eady. And by the way, really good run this year. I think he will actually be given a chance. I I hope and I I really want him to be drafted by a team. Um, I think it might be in the second round. Mm-hmm. Um, that do, does not definitely need to work on. Um his foot speed, but I think he'll be given a chance somewhere. And uh, when you're seven something, um, yeah. there's only so many guys that big in the world. Can he make the FIBA team? Oh, he will. Yes, I, I, um, I think he. I think he would. The he question would. is: is how does the because like usually teams when they get control of a guy, they may not want to. So I'll I'll put it this way: if he gets drafted, there's a chance that he might. If he doesn't get drafted. I don't know because he might be trying to figure out his contract. Mm, gotcha. Yep. And I think summer, I, I haven't looked at the schedule, but summer really? league. And, yeah. Summer and league. Stuff. Yeah, that's true. Cause I think he was what, August, September, I think it is. It's around then. And there's like weird exhibition matches. Yeah. And I, I need to look at the schedule, but I haven't. Mm-hmm. It's a, a later, later, uh, later endeavor, but yeah. So, um, I guess the next thing is just to talk about his defense and that's it for this guy. So, um, does anyone want to start, or uh, I guess I could start? <laughs> um, sure. Yeah, so I think he's just a high-motor athlete. I think he uh, is not I'm making it sound like, oh, you know, he, he gives effort, right? <laughs> like, that's it. I think he does a little bit more than that. I think his positioning is pretty good. He's had a couple sequences where he is both uh, switched between, you know, two or three different guys. He's good at closeouts, which, by the way, I forgot to say for the offensive side, he also attacks closeouts on the opposite end. 
but yeah, so, and I think he uh, has been willing to, uh, at times, maybe not uh, consistently to the point of like last year's Jalen Williams, the J A Y uh l i n williams your guy um yeah my guy um <laughs> seriously we gotta put a rule in there as nba yes yeah. you know, um talk no or more jaylens yeah the well, how to figure out how to talk about those two guys seriously yeah so it, this is uh so that jalen williams is really good at taking charges and keontae at times um and this when i see someone taking charges that to me that means and on a regular basis it tells me that they understand the game and they understand the feel of the defensive end of the game and their positioning is usually pretty sound. I didn't see him getting like blown by a whole bunch. And again, as uh, on the offensive side, I said like, I don't see him as being like hyper athletic yet. He gets to the rim. So he has some like enough athleticism to keep up with guys. Um, now as a defensive prospect, I think that there are better guys on the defensive end like Wallace, but we will get to Wallace in another day. But I don't think he's like, you know, He's better than uh, defensively as a uh, pseudo wing slash guard prospect than anyone that we've talked about thus far. Mm. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's not a knock that is, you know, that is strong. Yeah. I, and I think we, yeah, we just have to lean if it, from a Raptor standpoint, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta look for something. To, you gotta go more offense. Like you, we just can't. That too. Yeah. That we, too. We, we can't think we're going to just try and make someone to a score. One thing, the the other thing that I noticed is really quickly is that he navigates screens really well. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I have to go back to the film. I don't know if that's like a big problem that we've ever had, but it, it you know, for mm -hmm. a guard, it's kind of nice to have someone who can navigate screens and kind of get a little bit small when they need to, but also stay, you know. So, yeah. I think for, I think our perimeter guys actually are pretty good at that. Like, yeah. I think OG is really good at that. I think to be fair, I think Fred is actually pretty good at that. Yes. Um, Trent Jr. getting the right mood sometimes. Is, <laughs> he feels like he, he could be all right. You know, if you yeah. like four threes in a row, man, he's like fighting over every screen. When he's feeling it, and he's, you know, <laughs> give, give but, the ball back to me. <laughs> you're obviously quite good at it. So I think that's one yeah. of our strengths, actually. We actually, I, yes. think just, I think just in the game in Philly, we got two fouls off of that, if I recall. It, yeah. it, it, you know, so, yeah. So I but think maybe he fits on he from fits that. that yeah. 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 Um, any any other thoughts about his defense? I just say, well, I think, go, go ahead, Coach. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. No, you, go go for it. Finish your. Well, I only ahead. want a short statement as far as the defense go. I think it's the same type of like. There's a brashness and confidence about him, just like how is on the offensive end. There is a bit on the defensive end. There's a bit of a swashbuckler mentality with him. I kind of like it actually because I think this team needs a little bit of character like that. I kind of like <laughs> we got a lot, got a lot of nice dudes on this team, but I kind of like that about him. You know that he's you know, there's a brashness about how he plays on both ends of the court, and if you could just get wheeled in properly, well, you could have something really special. Right? From what I've seen from the numbers, the numbers aren't exactly appealing, especially the defensive win shares. I mean, he's not in the category of Anthony Black. Um, or Casey Walls, or even Bryce Sensabaugh, which, when you look at the numbers, that is slightly concerned. But from the film that I've watched, it looks like he's a pretty good help defender. Like, he knows where to be. I don't know if I would want him, you know, guarding James Harden. <laughs> Put it that way. Um, but I think there, I think his lateral quickness look, looks pretty good. It looks like he has long arms. Like, he might be 6'4", but it's not going to shock me if he hits a 6'9 wingspan. Like, yeah. he, looks like he's, he looks like he's got long arms for sure. He's got, he's got um, big shoulders too, like you know. Like, yeah, no, I think he's got a frame which he could fill out to, like you said, he could be like two fifteen, two twenty when you're six four at that. Like that's a sturdy guy for sure. Um, but I don't really see like a big cause for concern about his defense. I think he, I think he'll be a guy like he'll play good help defense. I think his defensive awareness is good. I just don't know if I'd want him, you know, guarding Drew Holiday or Chris Middleton. Um, right. in the playoffs so once again we'll see as time goes what he kind of like as a defender right and very similar to powell in this case who wasn't considered to be a great defender at first either you know, exactly like, you, know, he's a, you know he's a respectable one in this game too yep it's there so yeah i think i think the interesting thing is again notice how and this is more for the viewer notice how we're not mentioning their wingspan this is why um the combine is useful 
and why yeah. I look forward to the combine because then you get more information about these prospects. And also, depending on what workouts they do at the combine, you kind of get to see, you know, how do they do against the best of their peers? Right. And that's kind of a very interesting. I know it's a specific controlled environment, but it is still, you do glean some things. Like last year, we saw, you know, Leonard Miller was rising up, and then the combine came. And then he's like, okay, you know what? I'm pulling myself out of the draft. I'm going to go in a different route, which ended up serving him really well. And we see the development in his game, right? And I think there was a couple other dudes I can't think of off the top of my head yeah. um, that kind of fit the bill for that. So I think it, I think it's good. And I, I, you know, I just, I really liked, you know, a lot of things about him. I, I liked his ability to track defenders. Again, I'm going back to my own notes, uh, um, you know, fighting through screens. Um, I thought he was good at keeping his balance, which is really good when, um you absorb contact on both ends whether whether it's you know going at a guy or a guy going at you being able to to absorb the contact stay balanced stay stay kind of um not heavy footed but sure footed is i think really important uh it's something that i think barnes most recently has gotten a lot better at but initially he was quite heavy footed yes um especially on the like the heels of his feet okay. and um this this guy he stays on the balls of his feet f- fairly well so I, I really like him a lot. He's, he's actually, again, not ready to make a whole big board yet, mm-hmm. but uh, I, I would put him um, very, very high. Um, now, I guess a really, really quick question is, out of the prospects that we've talked about, um, I know, uh, uh, let's just say mm, Hendrix. Would you, who would you prefer? And I guess also Grady Dick as well. Um, of the, the three of them right now, I think, ooh, I think I would say probably Hendrix maybe first, George second, Grady third. The okay. only reason why is just the upside. That's the reason why. I just so you really believe in Hendrix's upside. I think he could be. A, I mean, I, I said coach put me on to about two or three weeks ago, and it's yes. like I really think. He could be like he could be something actually. I mean, I yeah, I think his upside could be very high. And I think that's the reason why both he and George's George mocks keep on moving all over the place because I think no one wants to give up on that upside. So I think every once in a while you see them sneak back into the top ten. Because <laughs> yes. I think someone's like, well, you know, this dude gets it right. For example, to your point, with the combines and of course the workouts, we saw it with Barnes. I think Barnes initially was going like nine at one point. Right? Yes, yes, and he was, yeah. Quietly creeping up, and then there's all of a sudden, by the time you got the week before the draft, all of a sudden, he's like, you know, he's like, you know, he was like, all of a sudden six, and yes. then the rumors started coming out about Toronto, I'm like, take it back four, you know, so, yeah. that, so, I mean, like, if George, your point, comes back, and he's healthy, and he starts knocking yeah. down jumpers left, right, and center, to coach's point, he puts on, like, 10, 15 pounds now, all he's coming in at 200 pounds, and he's knocking down jump shots, and all of a sudden, like, whoops, you know, because forget about just bodying dudes and like right. exactly. <laughs> yeah. we had a conversation amongst ourselves just in like I think it was like late January. George was in the top seven or eight, and this is when the yes. Raptors really was going. It was going the wrong way, so the Raptors were in that position at the time. And he yeah, we were in, like, "Well, we can get him now." Now we're like, right. well, "We can still and, get him now." <laughs> exactly right. So we right as we moved, he has moved as well. So maybe we're <laughs> with each other. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That that is that's a good point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um uh coach uh any final thoughts from you on on uh and and uh, to answer the question of hendrix uh grady or mr george that's that's a, that's a good three like just to, to know i think hendrix might have the higher ceiling but i want to say that george might be safer like he might be a safer what you get early from him his you might get more from him, yeah, than Hendrix. Hendrix might be a swing for the fences, but if you, if but if he if you hit a home run with him, you got you got yourself a, a very good player. Um, but I don't want to discredit Grady Dick too much from this Ooh. either because no, 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 he's this is a very this is a good athlete. Here, I mean, here's my thing. Here's the to your safest point. He's the one. If I say which one's the one I think is going to play in the rotation next year, guaranteed is Grady yes. without a doubt. Like, yes, like he can go. Like he, he, he's not spending a, a lick of time right. in the G League, watching, the, learning, <laughs> go, learning the game. No, <laughs> no, he's he's ready right now. And again, like the thing is, is that Green Dick, his upside is, yeah, I think it might be lower than some, 
but at the same time, um, I, I think he's still someone that fits in almost every single offense, like a glove. You know, how many teams could use a Kevin Herter? Well, hey, I, I, hey, you know who I like to compare it to, right? So yes, like, yes, he, I know, I know you. <laughs> it ain't that wrong being Clay Thompson in this case here. That's no, no, side, right? Like you know, like last I checked, that dude's going to the Hall of Fame. Last I checked, yes, he's the multiple yes. All Star games and all defensive teams. All they're like, who knows? We assumed that, and Clay Thompson coming out was going to be a defensive star. No one saw that coming. Yes, <laughs> that's that's very true. So. I mean, it's it's and that's also why um, a lot of it depends on like these these workouts, combine, all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. You know, sometimes you talk to a dude and that 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 completely can change. I think yeah, life. I think he's a guy that I think is gonna be very surprised when people see. That's the reason why I'm a little worried because I think that the you think he's guy, gone. Oh, I know. I have no doubt. Like I have no doubt in my mind he's not gonna be down there where the Raptors are unless the ping pong balls drop so fortuitous. If we're not making the play in. That's yep. the only way we get him, but he's gone because once those clinics start and he starts knocking down threes and pull up jumpers and floaters, it's gonna be a wrap. Okay, let me tell you something. So guys that we we know in this case right now, are like in the six seven territory, I can name nobody at the moment because we'll do him eventually. He's gonna start dropping down. I suspect, and then we're gonna be like, oh brother. It's you know, <laughs> I I do think that there's a chance, and we haven't gotten to him yet. But I, I'm not sure if you were talking about Kaysen, but. Uh, well, he yeah, he's a he's a funny guy too because he. I think like, he might come to our our, our thing when yeah. these guys with bigger upsides mm-hmm. might end up, you know. Right. Might yeah, end exactly. up surpassing. No, I think so too because I mean, let's face it: if you if your comp is Drew Holiday, no one's picking Drew Holiday as the first eight guys. <laughs> <laughs> and I know respect all respect, him. all respect to Drew Holiday, who is future Hall of Fame Drew Holiday. Yeah. Your upside, no, but that next set of guys, yes, Drew Holiday's gonna get picked there. So if yes. that's what you're looking at, I mean, fine. Like, you know, I have no problem with that either in this case here, man. That's fine. If he ends up being better, well, heck, here we go. And Drew Holiday just dropped 50. So, like, what are we talking about here? <laughs> well, I think in this draft, <laughs> one through three is set. It's yes. Wemby, it's Scoot, it's Miller in some fashion. We know Wemby's one. We don't know about the other two yet. My guess is Scoot will go second. Um, four through 15? I can probably guarantee that the Thompson, Amen Thompson will go early, but the rest of the guys that I keep seeing, I don't know. I don't know. And I, I, I have no idea. Yeah, I think I still think it's volatile with the Thompson twins and with Drace Walker. I think those three people, yep. and actually, I would put actually the boy from um, Anthony Black. I think those four to me. You I think they like, can go anywhere? I can go anywhere. Like, I can see. Yeah. I can see Anthony Black coming back and say his shooting's not that great, and all of a sudden, like, like, you know, like I can see that. Yeah, still, or the you know, overtime elite guys, and they're actually facing like real competition. And it's right. like, oh, okay, well, this, like, this guy is two like, years away from being, you know. <laughs> and all of a sudden, now it's like, you know what? We we're going to pull back a little bit. We ain't really sure about that. Like, those are the type of things that are running through my head where it's like, yeah, I don't know about that. You know, and that's why I can see some other guys, like, say, that, you know, our friend from Villanova. You know, first he's from Villanova, so that's already going to tell you one thing. <laughs> yes, taller, where he's a I, guy. I, right? Yeah, he's already moving up already. Where some some of them got around seven. So like, yeah. <laughs> I think I think he's safe to go there too. Like the yeah. Thompson, the first Thompson twin, Ahmed and Cam Whitmore. After that, yeah. mm, I really don't know. Right, because Walker's up there. Like I think some people have Walker as low as seven. Some have him at six. But I wouldn't be surprised after combines. All of a sudden, Cam Whitmore is now as a top five pick. That would not surprise me if that one comes out. Nope. Yeah, and I'm even looking at a different one. Um, this is the Ringer, and he's uh, at the level of fifth, uh, so which he, is you know, he, yeah. So so um, you know so O'Connor, O'Connor, those guys already got him moving up already to that top five already. And we haven't got anywhere yet. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So to, to just quickly close off this, um, uh, as usual, people, I always put a, a photo of the guy that we're talking about on the screen. So I'm kind of filling up a little bit of space so I can do that for myself and so people can read. <laughs> so um, I will be putting that on the screen. I'm not going to be saying it because we actually, I actually said uh, Beal already, and they kind of said shades. I'm reading right here, shades of Beal, ball handling, pull up threat, interior scoring, floater game, mm-hmm. uh, which is funny enough. I'm just reading it right now. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think it was good. I think uh, again, you look at some of the the negatives. Uh, 
Um, and you know, it, it, it's, I, it's, he's an interesting prospect and I, I, you know, I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. Um, but with that being said, uh, we're going to kind of close this conversation, uh, out. Um, it was always fun to chat with you guys, whether it's about the Raptors or really anything else, especially about the league. And, uh, again, if you enjoyed this conversation, um, first of all, sorry about my audio in the previous, uh, 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 things that are one which hasn't come out at the time of filming this, but will come out soon. But uh, sorry about that. I will do a much better job of my audio uh, moving forward. But like, comment, subscribe. And if there is a guy that you want us to cover, even if no one else wants to cover it, I'll find some time to cover them. Um, there are some limits, though, of course, like we need to be real, someone ideally in the range. But yeah, uh, I still have uh, Jalen uh, Hood. Uh, I still, I, 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 We'll look into Rayon at some point, um, and there's a couple other guys. So, yeah. Anyways, thank you. Uh, everyone have a great day, and take care. Peace. Oh, let me just...